All right, Davey, awesome. And welcome to Davey's Awesome Wrestling, where I review wrestling and related things all from the perspective of a fan, not an insider. So last week, I did WWE Clash of the Castle. That same weekend, we had TNA against All Odds. Those of you who've watched before, I've explained it. I really don't have time to do one review a week. Sorry, I have a job and a family. But this week, I will go ahead and get into my review of TNA against All Odds, live from Chicago, Illinois. The opening match, Mike Santana and Steve Macklin team up against the Rascals, Trey Miguel and Zachary Wentz. I was say it was a good opener. Just a little rivalry that needed to get settled. As Macklin recruited the Rascals to go against Mike Santana, and they turned on Macklin, and enemy of my enemy became my friend type thing. Towards the end, Miguel tried to pull out the spray paint, like he's known for doing, but was stopped by Macklin. And from there... Santana and Macklin both put a member of the Rascals in the corner in a Tree of Woe and did their Tree of Woe finishing moves, which was enough to get them the win. Then they shook hands and parted ways, which I'm glad about. Santana has done the tag team thing for long enough. Let's see what he can do as a singles. But ultimately, great opener. I would easily give it a 3 out of 5. Yeah! Then we had Rich Swan versus PCO. And it was said that, you know, PCO wrote a love letter to Steph DeLauder. And she was going to answer it after the match. As far as this match goes, there just really wasn't much to it. I mean, which Rich Swan did his, like, you know, acrobatic moves, dives and stuff. PCO dominated most of the match. Basically a typical PCO match where there just really isn't much to it. And then eventually he did get up and do the PCO assault. Got the pin and the win over Rich Swan. Again, really nothing to this. Then again, this is probably why I'm not a huge fan of PCO. I know a lot of people love it because it's a great gimmick. I'll give it that. You know, the whole French-Canadian Frankenstein. But I don't I don't get what everybody else loves about him so much. It's it's just never ever anything impressive. But afterwards, Steph DeLondre came out with the love letter. I said, we are none. And she said, we. Oui. Cool. This one I would only give a 2 out of 5. Eh. And then for the TNA Tag Team Championships, Ryan and Nick Nemeth versus The Systems, Brian Myers, and Eddie Edwards. I will say, so far at this event, there was one that was good, one that was eh. This stepped it up. This was a really good match. At one point, Dirty Dongo came out and immediately was tattling on the ref about Alyssa Edwards' involvement so that she would get barred from ringside. Which was making us wonder, like, what's going on? Is Dirty Dongo turning face here? But then Moose came out, but off camera, so we couldn't see who did it. As the Nemeths were about to get the win, the ref was pulled out of the ring. And they were arguing, was it Moose, was it Dongo? Until the argument got settled when Dongo struck Ryan and Nemeth, so that Eddie Edwards could get the boss knee party, get the pin, and retain the tag team titles for the system. So, looks like Dirty Dongo is in league with the system, or maybe he's now a part of the system. That wasn't answered at this event. That's for the future. But this match, like I said, step things up. I would easily give this one a 4 out of 5. <laughs> then we had Frankie Kazarian versus Joe Hendry. It was okay, but for these two, it was kind of lackluster. I expected a bit more. Especially the end. As Joe Hendry was getting a belly-to-back suplex onto Kazarian, and he had a loaded fist that he hit him with. And that was it. Just fell down, pinned him, match is over. And at the moment, we had to see the replays because we were all sitting here watching going, what, what just happened? But after the match, Kazarian put Joe Hendry into the chicken wing, just because. But a steel was at ringside and broke it up, leading to later Frankie Kazarian challenging a steel on television. So, you know, it was a little interesting. Just like I said, I expected a little bit more. I'd still, though, easily give this a 3 out of 5. Yeah! Then for the X Division Championship, Trent Seven challenges champion Mustafa Ali. Now, here was the thing. It being in Chicago, Mustafa Ali being from Chicago, honestly didn't feel there was much chance of Trent Seven walking out with the title. But in the beginning of the match, Trent Seven played a video of Mustafa Ali insulting Chicago. So it made me go, okay, maybe. And I will say, this was a good match. Even though at one point there was like a very nasty spill on both parts where Trent Seven pushed Mustafa Ali off the top of the ring rope and he fell all the way to the floor, but he himself fell all the way to the floor. But then even an interesting way to end the match. As Mustafa Ali had been working Trent Seven's knee, 
did his patented 450 splash, but on to Trans Seven's legs so that he could then put him in the sharpshooter and Trans Seven had no choice but to tap out. Meaning Mustafa Ali is still the X Division champion, which is honestly, in my opinion, a good way to go. I talked about the last time I reviewed a TNA event. I'm very happy with what's going on with Mustafa Ali. The entire time he was in WWE, I was waiting for him to get interesting and he just couldn't seem to get there. And he's gotten there. I don't want him to lose the X Division championship just yet. This is another one I would easily give a four out of five. Then, not only a tag team match, but a match mark in the return of Josh Alexander. As ABC, Ace and Bay Club, challenged Eric Young and Josh Alexander. This was a great match. It was very exciting. Ton of back and forth. But I will say, at one point in this match, it got nuts. But then it ended when Eric Young was about to get the pile driver onto Chris Bay. But as he bent over, that gave Ace Dawson just enough time to run over and get the fold finisher onto Eric Young so that they could get the pin and the win. Which, honestly, I didn't expect. I thought they were going to give it to Josh Alexander and Eric Young because it was his return, but I'm glad they gave it to the tag team instead. Even though they've been kind of building up that there might be a breakup between Ace and Bay Club soon, I hope there isn't, honestly. I like them as a tag team. I think they're a great tag team. (laughs) This match wasn't very flashing, just very exciting. I'd give this one another 4 out of 5. Then, for the TNA Knockouts Championship, Jordan Grace did an open challenge. Which I gotta say, I thought was a weird thing to do on a big event like Against All Odds. The open challenges are for like weekly television shows. But whatever. Answering her open challenge was NXT's Tatum Paxley. It made sense, but I just didn't like it. I mean, I get that Tatum Paxley, while Jordan Grace was at NXT, she tried to steal her title, but since they're doing this whole interpromotional thing, they couldn't, like, have a bit of a rivalry. They, She challenged her or something. But no, she just went out there and answered an open challenge. And as soon as she got out there, of course, Ash by Elegance comes out, just sits on the apron, sips champagne like she does. And then the match between Tatum Paxley and Jordan Grace, it was okay. It wasn't great. Tatum Paxley put in a little offense. At one point got her finisher of the lobotomy, but that was about it. Most of it, she was just dominated by Jordan Grace. But not only that, but there was no sense on my side being the fan watching, thinking that the champion was in any real danger of losing their title. Like, if they weren't going to give Jordan Grace the NXT Women's Championship, then they definitely weren't going to give Tatum Paxley, of all people, the TNA Knockouts Championship. And it just went how we figured it would go. Tatum Paxley eventually got caught in the juggernaut driver, and Jordan Grace got the pin and the win. After the match, Ash by Elegance attacked Jordan Grace, but that didn't work out for her because Jordan Grace is bigger and stronger and beat her up and poured champagne all over her. Ultimately, like I said, that made this a little bit interesting, and I'm not going to say it was bad, but it wasn't great, and I really did feel like this was kind of weird to put on a big event like this, but I'd still give it a 3 out of 5. Yeah! Then the main event for the TNA World Championship, Broken Matt Hardy versus Moose in a Broken Rules match. Which is just a no holds barred. But I will say, this match was awesome. Of course it was brutal. It was no holds barred. And because it was no holds barred, and of course the system was all going to be there, it started with the Nemeths coming out and taking out Brian Myers and Eddie Edwards. So that they would not be a factor in this match. And at one point, Matt Hardy grabbed a box from underneath the ring, prompting the commentators to go, What's in the box? Which irritated the crap out of me. Because I was going to do that. And it turned out, in the box, was a New England Patriots helmet. You know, going back to Moose being a member of the New England Patriots. Towards the end of the match, Alyssa Edwards got involved as she was beating Broken Matt Hardy with a kendo stick. But this just led to Rebecca Hardy coming out. It's weird for me to say that. I'm used to calling her Rebby Sky. But then it ended when Moose pulled her in front of a table that was set up as Matt Hardy was charging him. So he accidentally put his wife through the table. And this allowed Moose to get his spear, the pin, the win, and he retains the TNA World Championship. And after this, of course, the system started beating up Matt Hardy. The Nemeths came out to help him. They kind of took them out. Even Joe Hendry came out. Didn't help. What helped was when we got the return of Jeff Hardy. Which I can't feign too much excitement about that just because the moment Matt Hardy showed up, I think we all knew eventually so will Jeff. 
However, just for the craziness, the story, everything involved in this match, easily, this was match of the night, and easily, five out of five. Yay! So, TNA Against All Odds 2024. Pretty good show. I wouldn't say it was better than the other show that aired that weekend. But it was good. You know, it was steady. There weren't any matches that I would say were very bad. There was just one that was meh. But I get why they do it. I get people like PCO. Personally, I'm not a big fan. Just, again, because there's never really anything to his matches. It's just the character. They did continue this whole TNA, NXT, interpromotional thing, which, you know, sure, okay, I just don't feel they did that the right way. I personally think that it was an easy thing. They could have Tatum Paxley go down there for a little bit, have a little bit of a rivalry, but no, they decided to just do the one-off. I'm still hoping let's do a little out-of-the-box kind of thinking, and maybe, just maybe, somebody from NXT or somebody from TNA wins one of these titles but i doubt they'll do that i honestly think they're going to keep doing this interpromotional stuff for a little bit and then that's going to be it for a while at least because at the moment no wwe does not own tna they're just working with them they have a working relationship kind of like tna had with aew however in that instance though they did let an aew wrestler in fact two aew wrestlers be their champion mostly it was threes and fours there was only one five but that five really knocked it out of the park. I was very happy that Matt Hardy was able to put on such a great match. Mostly because I talked about the last time I reviewed an event, the one where Matt Hardy came back. I was seriously wondering if Broken Matt Hardy had just ran its course, or if it was just something that only worked in a certain area where he had certain freedoms. It seems like it was the latter. Because the Broken Matt Hardy character seems to be working again in TNA. It didn't work in WWE, it did not work in AEW, but it's working here. And sometimes that's just how it works. Sometimes things just work in certain promotions and don't in others. It's not a bad thing, it just happens. But I also felt there was still more life in that character, so I'm glad to see it back. Jeff Hardy making his return, like I said, I, I'm not going to pretend to be all that excited about that. I not only expected him to come back because of Matt Hardy coming back, but honestly, just again, it's just my opinion as a fan, but it's not as exciting anymore. Like, Jeff Hardy, in my opinion, if he's going to be back and he's going to be interesting, then he needs to start doing something a little different because he's basically just doing the same thing he's been doing for like 20 years now. But we'll see how that goes in the future. I even like the concept of the Nemeths teaming together. Like for the longest time in wrestling, we've known that Ryan Nemeth is out there. His brother, Nick Nemeth, was Dolph Ziggler. What would it be like if they ever got to team together? They honestly did pretty good. They had that great brother tag team chemistry. I would love to see them as the tag champs eventually. But to the event overall, like I said, it kept my attention. It was interesting enough, but I wouldn't say it was fantastic. So I don't quite think it earned a four, but very, very close. As I would say, easily, hands down, solid, three out of five. Yeah! There you have it. That's my wrestling review this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure to hit like, hit subscribe, hit the little bell so you get notifications when I post the videos. And leave a comment that I can respond to in my next comment corner. Tell me what you guys thought of TNA Against All Odds. Tell me if you thought it was better than Clash of the Castle the same weekend. Tell me if you thought it was worse. Tell me if you're excited about Jeff Hardy being in TNA again. Love you guys!